how do you reshape some of these things that are happening in your life that you're uncomfortable with? That's a sign that you need boundaries when you're feeling that discomfort in your interactions. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. Hi, TBM community. This is Heather, one of the coaches, and I'm here to share the most beautiful and magical story of a client that I have worked with now for almost a year. And I am so proud to say that this gentleman has transformed before my eyes. He has manifested so much. The shift that he has created within himself, I can see it in his face, I hear it in his voice. It's truly a gift for me to have seen the transformation. So I'm going to break this down for you. He has done all of the workshops, how to manifest, inner child, shadow, money, rock bottom, unblocked no, boundaries multiple times. He does the daily practice. He has made this a part of his every day. And we always talk about that, right? Those that get the furthest are the ones that truly commit. And I can say that this gentleman has committed to himself. The biggest blocks that has come up for him is really being not enough. There's something that must be wrong with him, that it's not safe to be seen that he has to perform or be productive and achieve to receive love, that he can't trust what he feels, that he's responsible for how others feel, and that also that he is lazy. Now, he's had multiple rock bottoms along the way that had him reassess. But the biggest thing that came up in the beginning was that he had never even heard of concepts of inner child and shadow and reprogramming. So that was really important that we really broke it down on what does it mean to do that? And why is it so important to look at your inner child, to look at the shadow, and to understand that if you can feel something, that you need to heal it. So there were many times where he didn't move on from a workshop because we needed to go back in and he needed to reassess. A big thing that came up was around work, right? This idea of being productive. And he lost his job because he was in the hospitality restaurant business in COVID. And that took a huge hit for him. You know, he had been focusing so much on his productivity around success with work and money, et cetera. So who was he if he didn't have work? He also was quarantining in isolation, so he had a lot of downtime. And of course, there were times where he felt alone. But what we really focused on was him trusting himself, him getting to know himself. And what constantly came up over and over and over again was that he needed rest. And that because he had been pushing so hard for so many years, 
he didn't even know what rest felt like. And so he checked in every day. What do I need today? And what am I missing? And there were days where he had things planned and changed them and stopped because he needed to rest. He needed to journal. He needed to listen to a DI. He allowed himself to come out of fight or flight. And that meant turning down jobs. He did take a couple, which ended up being tests, and we got through them together, you know, of looking at what could he learn from it? How could he learn from this as a teacher? And so we continued to strategize around using the subconscious reintegration DI, competence DI within inner child, and really digging around the fear of being rejected with the safety of being seen. And what happened is as he started to come out of this quarantining and needing to see family and friends, he was reappearing as a new person. And so, of course, they were shadow around that. Are they going to accept this new version of himself? He became the observer versus the absorber. And that was super powerful. One of the strategies that I had him use was constantly keeping track of what triggers are coming up. How could we find patterns? And what he saw consistently is that whenever he perceived a situation or experience as taking longer than it should be, he would be completely triggered. And he'd go back into believing that he was doing something wrong. And what that meant was is that if he was doing something wrong, his go-to was to immediately abandon his need. It didn't matter how he was feeling, but he wanted to quickly fix it. He wanted to jump into action. And we always talked about what was the energy into his action. We reassessed his authentic code in every session as well. Was he still in alignment with his authentic code? And guess what? His authentic code changed as he grew, as he became more authentic, as he started to learn to see who he was as this new version of himself, his authentic code started to shift with him. We were able to make sure everything that he was doing was in alignment with his authentic code. We constantly celebrated his non-tangible wins in every session. So even though at one point he felt like there wasn't a lot coming in, the reframe was is that everything that he had gained was so much more valuable than any item on his list. The best part is, is that he constantly could feel the change. He could see when he was up leveling and it's just, again, I cannot go on anymore on how beautiful it is. And so I want to read a quote as I end this from him. I can't believe how far I've come in only a year. I am the happiest I've ever been. I've reframed limiting mindsets, reprogrammed limiting beliefs, seen myself with love for the first time I can ever remember, and really felt deserving of asking, what do I want and what do I need? for the first time. I'm excited to see what's next. A year ago, I felt lost and alone with no direction and judging myself for what my life looked like on the heels of turning 40. Today, I relish the position I'm in and know that I can create anything I want. I am grateful and humbled. I can honestly say as his coach, he constantly expands me on what it means to grow within this work. He is a beautiful soul and has found himself by putting in the effort. So in closing, the takeaway here is to not give up if actual items are not coming through on your list, but to really look to see, are you becoming closer to your authentic self? Are you aligning with your authentic code? Can you start to see the triggers and the patterns? Can you start to shift your mindset in seeing that these are stories that don't belong to you? And can you make sure that your energy behind your action is coming from high self-worth? Now, don't give up. Again, if things physically are not coming through, but this is about paying attention to how do you feel? What are you missing? And who are you becoming?
And now, a word from our partners. So a few episodes back, you heard me talk about Beekeepers Natural, really giving the backstory to the product and the brand. And specifically in that, I talked about their bee pollen and all of its incredible medicinal vitamin and mineral benefits, as well as their bee-powered superfood honey that you keep seeing me on Instagram using as a face mask. It's the equivalent of how Manuka honey is a face mask, but times a thousand with royal jelly, raw bee pollen, and propolis inside of it. And you've heard from the founder at this point, so you know how into this brand we are, how much we believe in it, and how much we're using it. But today I want to highlight two of their other products to put on your radar. The first product that I want to talk about of theirs today to highlight is their Brain Lixer Brain Fuel. So Max specifically has stolen all of mine (laughs) and taken it recently. And what makes it so incredible is that it has 500 milligrams of royal jelly and then it has ginkgo biloba in it. So... It's a neuroprotective agent from toxicity, which is humongous. Also, all of the research that's coming back from Royal Jelly is that it's incredible brain fuel, helping to support your transmission system. So think brain-body connection, think all the work you're doing here at To Be Magnetic with neuroplasticity, and helping to create new clean neurons, which is neurogenesis. But the reason why Max loves it so much and steals it from me is because it totally supports productivity hacking. So it really gets your brain zooming and functioning without any caffeine, refined sugar, and a very gentle adaptogenic formula. Also amazing for anybody like myself who has struggled with any type of adrenal issues, autoimmune, or those with Lyme, because it's remarkable for cutting through brain fog. So again, that's their Beelixir Brain Fuel. And then the second thing I want to put on your radar that is their most popular product is the propolis throat spray that can be used daily. It's literally your immunity bodyguard in a bottle. So it's a natural immune support. It's a scratchy throat rescue. So anytime you have a cold coming on, it's germ fighting, it's antioxidant rich. It has 300 plus beneficial compounds. And essentially you can think of propolis as nature's ultimate defender especially daily for immune boosting and anti-inflammatory. Also, what I love about this, when I got to speak to the founder, Carly, myself, I love when people reinvent the medicine cabinet, which is exactly what Beekeepers Natural is doing. And she in particular uses this like you would Neosporin. So anytime you have a cut, scrape, anything like that, because it's so anti-inflammatory and has so many antioxidants, germ fighting, you literally would spray it on and it's been shown to help heal and reduce anything like that much quicker without, of course, having to use anything like Neosporin that it still has a small amount of antibiotic in it. And that goes for burns as well. So I think that this particular product, the Propolis Throat Spray, is by far the most accessible for daily use and certainly a must to pack when you're traveling again, when you're allowed to, based on the restrictions in your area, in order to spray before the plane, after the plane, and throughout your travels to keep your immune system really high. And for all of the parents out there that are thinking, but what about my kids? There also is a throat spray for kids that can be used daily as well. And it's all safe and natural from bees. So go ahead and use the code TBM, all caps, at checkout to receive 15% off. Again, that's all caps, TBM, to receive 15% off your purchase. When we first decided to take on partnerships in order to take this podcast to the next level for you, it was an absolute no-brainer to partner up with Blue Blocks. You've heard me talk about them for, I think, about a year and a half to two years at this point. Just like you, I first discovered them listening to a podcast. And as a listener, I used the code of the podcast to buy my very first pair, which was a nighttime pair with the red lenses. And what hooked me about that specific episode is it goes so in depth, just like the two episodes we have with founder Andy Mant, into why blue light is so hormonally disrupting, disrupts our sleep patterns, our natural circadian rhythms. And then I became a huge expert on light pollution. And I've gone on now to buy multiple of their products with my own money. 
The very favorite that I use every single evening. I also take it with me every place I travel so that I can use it on the airplane and I can use it for jet lag as well as using it for DIs during the day and the evenings is the sleep mask. Now, before this, I used many sleep masks because I was doing the DIs with them. However, once they released this product, I've never looked back. And I own three of them, again, that I've bought with my own money. I have one at the Forest House. I have one that's always packed and ready for travel. And I have one in Topanga. What's so miraculous about these is that they've developed them so that they're kind of like goggles, meaning that when they're over your eyes, they're not smashing your eyes. So they're not creating wrinkles. They're also not creating your eyelashes lashes to smash and get into your eyes, things that I've experienced with other eye masks. So it's kind of like a goggle in the sense that you can actually open your eyes when you're wearing them and you can move your eyes around. But here's the kicker, and it's totally backed by science, they 100% block out light. So If you've been looking for an eye mask to do DIs with, to travel with, or like me, if you still are in the country and receive light pollution at night, which I do in Topanga coming in through the valley, you will want to pick these up. If anybody's ever struggled with any type of fertility or hormonal disruption like I have, you will want to listen to the two episodes linked below that I have with the founder, Andy Mant, where he goes deep into the science of how blue light disrupts our circadian rhythm, our hormones, our sleep, and our happiness. So use the code at checkout, all caps, MAGNETIC, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C, to receive 15% off your purchase. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Expanded. Jessica here. I'm so excited to announce today's guest, who will be on with Lacey. Her name is Nedra Tawab. She's a licensed therapist and sought-after relationship expert. She helps people create healthy relationships by teaching them how to implement boundaries. And her philosophy is that the lack of boundary and assertiveness underlie most of our relationship issues. And her gift is helping people create those healthy boundaries with themselves and then with others. So this episode is so good. I've been following Nedra forever on Instagram. She has the best tips and tools and insights around boundaries with ourselves, with our friends, with our families, and especially in our relationships. And she highlights an important conversation around boundaries that we haven't talked about before in this podcast, this idea between porous and rigid, how we can set them and then take action behind them to really keep them in place. And she also really touches on this idea that People might think they don't have boundaries or they don't need boundaries, but in actuality, we all have boundaries happening all the time. Some of them just aren't good or aren't honoring our needs. So it's important to, you know, kind of like the idea in manifestation, take yourself into the driver's seat. You're manifesting at all times, whether you know it or not, and you are enacting and interacting with boundaries at all times, whether you know it or not. So it's best to head into the driver's seat of your life and start to play with those dynamics in your life. The episode's really fascinating. Lacey shares some personal examples as well. I know you guys will love this one. Well, welcome, Nedra. So beautiful to have you on the podcast. It's actually something we've wanted for a really long time. So when your team reached out, we were like, ah, yes, absolutely. So welcome. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. So one question we kick off with everybody, which is a little bit spiritual, is do you know your astrological sign or your moon rising sun. We love to astrologically profile here. Oh, someone, a a very gracious person sent me a whole four page layout of all of those things. And I don't remember. I am um, the beginning of May. So I know that zodiac wise, I am a Taurus, but I do not know she had something for the rising and the, and, and I can't remember it. Torin makes sense, though, for the work you do. To me, really? very grounding, can hold the space, probably especially good at boundaries, which we're going to get into a lot. Ooh, tell me why. You know, the Torins that I know, especially women, I find women and male energy to be very different, but the women that I know are just so close to the earth. You know, you guys are very known to be 
so grounded, so earthy into the pleasures of life and very, not stubborn, I don't want to say, that's always the association, but I think very strong. So to me, energetically setting boundaries when healed and integrated seems as if it could come very naturally to you, as opposed to someone who's maybe more airy or fiery. Uh, You feel, in my experience, very sturdy. Thank you for that assessment. Maybe the next book will be Zodiac um, Signs and Boundaries. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to be honest, I could see that selling very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've, I've heard the stubborn thing as well. And I think it is, you know, definitely an interesting piece of information in, in conversation. Because as you stated, I never think of myself as stubborn. Because when I come to a decision about something, know that I've thought long and hard internally. I may not have said, I've been thinking about this for two years, but it's something that I've really thought about and processed. And so when I get to a no, I really mean it. When I get to, I am done with this, I really mean it. And so, yeah, I I think that is that like courageous part of being a Taurus that, that you spoke to and I think the opposite is true, too. Like if somebody's like, you can't do that. I'm like, I absolutely can. And I do most times Um, just because I'm like, oh, you want to doubt me. So (laughs) I think great, great qualities to have and especially as a woman. So I love that. And then the second question we always kick off with is what's your cultural background and upbringing? Well, I am from Detroit, Michigan, and I am Black. When I was growing up in Detroit, I would say that it was probably 85 to 90 percent Black. And so I feel like I was raised in a really rich culture of Blackness, and it, it really did ground me. And so when I got older and went to college and, you know, I eventually moved to Charlotte, I feel like my identity has been fortified by the years of being within my culture and seeing, you know, so many people at different levels doing, you know, really great things. And, you know, just being from a culturally rich city, it feels really good to have that foundation. I know for my kids, sometimes I'm like, gosh, you don't get this. And I'm like, oh, okay, we didn't grow up in the same spot. So, but yeah, I think it really helped me to understand myself because I think whatever culture you're a part of, it's so important to see people who look like you doing things and being in community with you. And I know in Detroit, there are some pockets of areas where it is saturated with that culture. And I think we do that in any city, state, country, because there is just something about being around people who who look like you and understand you that just makes you feel really good. So I'm happy to have had that. So when I became a teenager and, you know, a little self-esteem stuff came up, it was like, oh, I know how to handle this. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, I am from Detroit and um, I'm a black woman. And we, we term that here energetically as expanders. So the importance of having anyone around you that you identify with that you can see to believe that what they're doing, you can do as well. Did you have many of those in the field of psychology growing up? Oh gosh, no. Um, no, I think it's interesting because growing up in Detroit, that doesn't mean that, you know, like my teacher, my, my third grade teacher, Mr. Anden, white male, he, he was like, you know, Vanessa Williams is Miss America. And he went out of his way to really help black kids, (laughs) like understand the importance of, of culture and not, you know, just like figures that are like, like, this is someone you can look up to. Oh, look at this other person, you know? So I I feel like I got a lot of that, but not any psychology. (laughs) And what took you to that? I mean, obviously probably college, you started to find the interest, but what took you down the road? Because you're incredible at what you do. Oh, thank you so much. I really like being in conversation with people. And I remember when I was in high school, the only people who could talk to the school social worker were people who were in 
some sort of special education class. And so everybody else, it was like, what is your problem? I'm like, I just want to talk. And they're like, no, <laughs> no, no, you're fine. You're fine. I'm like, I want to talk because I knew something was there. Right. Like I'm like, you know, I, I at that time in high school, I watched Oprah. I read self-help books. You know, I've always really been into deep conversation with people. And so I wanted to like talk about stuff. And they're like, no, you have to have this really big problem. And that's when it, you know, sort of I'm like, gosh, so you have to have a really big problem to talk to someone. And so I was a bit confused. And so when I started college, I wanted to go for maybe social work, but I didn't go that way because I was like, well, I don't know if I want to, you know, have to talk to people with really big problems. Like it, it seemed like such a small portion of what we could do because I didn't have examples of, no, actually you could talk to someone about work. Maybe they just want to talk about grief or something else. I thought it, you know, had to be really big. And so when I started college, my major was sociology and Africana studies. And grad school is when I decided, I think I want to dig more into this because sociology is about like group dynamics and interactions of people, which I really love. I love watching people interact. I really love talking to people. But that one-on-one piece is what I wanted to move towards. So grad school, I said, I'm going to do social work. And I always say I I became a therapist the first moment I had a client. Like it was such a beautiful experience to really be in a space to listen to someone who really, really needed to be heard. And after that, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And the rest is history. And boundaries in particular, which to me, and especially what we teach in manifestation is, is magnetism. When you can set that, just watch the universe show up for you. How did you really find a specialty in that? Because I think it's so important and for many years has been so undervalued. Now I think it's it's quite popular. But yeah, tell me how you sort of ended up in that space. Well, I think my first specialty was the guilt of setting boundaries. That was my first specialty <laughs> from personal experience. <laughs> And when I was in grad school, one of the professors recommended if you're going to be a therapist, you should go to therapy to see what this process is like. And our college offered maybe 12 or so free sessions. And I said, oh, OK, I'll, I'll check it out. And I went and I found myself talking about my relationships and how I had boundaries. But what was happening Um, people were really pushing back against the boundaries. So I was just feeling bad all the time. Like, well, I told them I couldn't help them, but they're mad. And so I'm processing, you know, this stuff. And my therapist didn't mention the B word, but she gave me this book and it's called Where You End and I Begin. And I read that book and I was like, I can set boundaries. Like I just felt so empowered. There is a word for this thing. It's called a boundary. It's actually healthy and I have a right to do it. And so as I began my work as a therapist, I noticed that other people have boundary issues too. It comes up in different ways. Sometimes it's work-life balance. Sometimes it's not wanting to go home for the holidays. Sometimes it's telling your alcoholic family member you don't want to be around them when they're intoxicated. Sometimes it's codependency. It can be so many things, but the big issue is boundaries. Boy, oh boy, was it. It's something I'm still, I think it's a lifelong process, but growing up as a codependent child of an alcoholic, you know, all the things, it was certainly a very hard journey for me at first. And for the very the thing you just mentioned, it's the guilt aspect, you know, through codependency. So before we get too deep into it, for the new listener who may have heard this terminology because it's so popular, how do you actually define boundaries? I define boundaries as parameters for how a person can engage, interact, and treat you. Those boundaries can be verbal, things that you express to other people, or they can be action, things that you allow them to do or things that you do to feel safe in your relationships with others and in your relationships with things. So social media technology is an area where we all need boundaries, but it's really a healthy outline 
to let people know what you can and cannot do. And I think it's a very loving act. I think sometimes people think, oh, you're setting boundaries because you're so stern, you're so mean. And to that, I say in relationships where I'm, you know, detached from the relationship, I don't even set boundaries because I'm leaving the relationship, (laughs) you know? So the boundary is like me saying this relationship is so important to me. This is what I will do to preserve it. And, you know, something I used to think when I was a teenager or tough or all, you know, all the stuff before I started working on myself was I have, I have great boundaries, you know, until I really understood it. And then I started in my 20s realizing I have no boundaries, nothing. What are signs that you need healthy boundaries? You know, the first sign is how are you feeling? So often we bypass our feelings. We've learned to ignore them when we feel anxious, uncomfortable, frustrated. We just ignore it. I get a lot of this, particularly around holidays where people are like, oh, my gosh, my mom is coming to visit. And they're like anxious about this this visit. And a lot of it has to do with there are no boundaries. You're, you know, in some cases, your parent may come visit and it's stressful because they're like cleaning up your house. They're telling you what to do and, you know, all of these things. And with boundaries, the visit can actually be more pleasurable for the both of you. So how do you reshape some of these things that are happening in your life that you're uncomfortable with? That's a sign that you need boundaries when you're feeling that discomfort in your interactions. And I love in your book, in the introduction section, people listening are like, okay, I get that. But you have a whole list. You know, it's you feel overwhelmed. You feel resentment towards people asking you for help. You avoid phone calls. I can really attest to that one. And interactions with people you think might ask for something, you know, and that can show up as ghosting and just completely not addressing situations. And others, you make comments about helping people and getting nothing in return. You feel bummed out. You frequently daydream about dropping everything and disappearing. I can certainly identify with that one. And you have no time for yourself. So your ears should be perked (laughs) if any of those resonate for the rest of this conversation. And I love, too, that you mention you know, how a lack of self-care, can't even find time to make a healthy meal or or five minutes to meditate is one of the first signs of a boundary issue. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the lack of self-care is rampant. And we live in a society where doing too much is like praise. It's like, I'm so busy. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I have this, I have that. I think the pandemic slowed us down a bit, but then, you know, after a few months, we just busied ourselves with, you know, Zooms and this and that. And there has to be space in your life for you. There has to be space in your life for rest. And so it's really important to tune into what are some of the things that you want to do that you don't feel like you have the time or capacity to do? because you are the manager of your time. So what are you not creating space for that is so important to you? How do we put the time towards the things that are really important to us? Like maybe meditating for five minutes. And what do you think are the biggest contributors, especially in childhood, I would assume, that's how we sort of view everything, that contribute to not having a healthy relationship with setting boundaries? The biggest one in childhood is people pleasing. I mean, we're taught to be people pleaser. Isn't that what being the kid is? Just listen to what every adult says to you. We're taught that you have to do these things sometimes in order to be loved. And definitely in order to be a part of this family, these are the things you need to do. And if you don't act and behave in this exact way, it is problematic. We have a word for kids who have their own individual personality. We call them bad. We call them problem child. You know, like we have these words for them. And sometimes, you know, sometimes there are some behaviors there that may need to be shaped, but sometimes it's they're not going along with the program. 
They're just not going along with the program. So with kids, there is a lot of shaping them out of who they naturally are. And for some reason, when we become adults, there's this expectation that we'll just be assertive, we'll take care of ourselves well, and that's a lot of unlearning we have to do. We've been programmed to actually not be assertive. We've been programmed to listen to everyone, to get feedback from everyone, to make sure everybody else is happy. And so with boundaries, what we're essentially doing is deprogramming ourselves. Amen. We really believe in that here (laughs) and the importance of it for yourself. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. We have Unblocked Boundaries, the up-level workshop that covers how to navigate a rut if you're in one, a rock bottom, or how to take things to the next level. And access to the community group where you can connect with over 12,000 other manifestors on this journey to find expanders, ask them how to navigate blocks you might be in, tests you might be receiving, and create community. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. And do yourself a favor. As you know, if you've been listening to our manifestation episodes, three things have to be in motion to manifest, unblocking, expanding, and passing tests. The expanding portion is seeing to believe, showing your subconscious that what you want is possible through engaging, encountering with, or reading about, or watching what we call expanders. That's somebody you identify with who has gone on to manifest, is successful in, or inhabits what you want. And you can find on our homepage what's called the motivation. It's the testimonial library where you will read thousands and you can pick the category that you're particularly manifesting, say money, career, love, travel, and so forth. And by reading those stories and going through their step-by-step experience, what they were calling in, what workshops they did to receive it, tests they passed, their magic darks, the expanders that they had to find, you are already creating space in your subconscious for your manifestation to come through. You can find that linked below or on our homepage under the Motivation Testimonial Library. Okay, now back to the episode. And what I love too, I don't know if this is something you've created individually, but it really, really resonated with me, the three levels of boundaries that you can set or experience, porous, rigid, and healthy. Tell us about that a little bit. Yes. So I talk to a lot of people and they'll say, I don't have any boundaries. And I automatically think you have boundaries. They're just unhealthy. And so those unhealthy boundaries When you say you don't have any, it's typically like porous boundaries. And what those are, it's just they're weak. They haven't been well-defined. Sometimes we haven't spoken the boundary to the other person. And then rigid boundaries is when we actually build walls to keep people out and to keep ourselves, quote unquote, safe. And so we have these hard rules about 
what we won't do to minimize our vulnerability with other people. And then healthy boundaries is where we really start to operate in a space of doing what we can when we can, really being in our relationships, asking for what we want, asking that people honor our boundaries. That is the healthy space. But typically when we say, oh my gosh, I don't have any boundaries, they are typically porous. And when we are so strong, like the strong friend, the strong one, we are typically acting in that rigid space of boundaries. Yeah, and I certainly have been in both. And going into the porous model, something, you know, as a child of an alcoholic that I think is so interesting is going back on boundaries or not fully following through with them. You know, and then the rigid one is like cutting people out. You know, there's an extra trigger around it or activation when maybe there should be a little bit more healing (laughs) surrounding a boundary is sort of how I can relate to that. So with cutting people out. um, Yeah, let's hear about that. It can sometimes be a rigid boundary and it can also be a protective boundary. It really depends on what's happening with the person. If this is a habitual boundary violator, someone who never respects your boundaries, even though you've expressed them, cutting them out, I would not term that a rigid behavior. I think lots of times when we're doing things in a rigid way, we may not have expressed it. We haven't even said to the person, this is what I need, but our go-to is to cut them out. Now, sometimes when you're dealing with a habitual boundary violator, a key thing that they will say is, I don't remember you saying that. You know, they have like this boundary amnesia where they're like, I I don't remember a boundary. It's like, I I said it last time. I said it this time. And then I texted it to you. (laughs) So we have all of the boundaries there. Because there are some people who just don't want to respect a boundary and you are well within your rights as a healthy human to say, this is a relationship that I can't continue because it is unhealthy for me. I was just on Instagram doing some Q&As and a person asked me, my father is an alcoholic. How do I tell him that I don't want to be around him when he is drunk? And my response was, you already have the words. I don't want to be around you when you're drunk. Now, here is your power. What do you do when this person violates your boundaries? Because what I know about alcoholism is it means you don't have control over your usage. And so if this is the case and this person continues to come around you when they're drunk, how do you activate your boundaries? We can't stop them for drinking. Does that mean that you need to only talk to them first thing in the morning when they're sober? Does that mean that you say, hey, okay, wow, I didn't know you were drunk. I need to leave. Like, what boundaries do you put in place in your relationship with this person? Because telling people what to do sometimes isn't always the most effective way to issue a boundary because sometimes they can't honor it. Yeah. And I love, you know, I learned that very young. The only person we have control over in our space is ourselves. So I love the examples you gave of exiting the situation. That was something I had in place was we can only speak in the morning when you're sober. Something we talk about, we have a boundary course that's really based on the energetics of manifestation. And something we talk about a lot is that you will instantly see the other person's shadow. You know, when you change a behavior or a pattern you've been set in for quite some time, often somebody's shadow will rear. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's something that people fear the most about setting boundaries is feeling guilty or having to have a different dynamic or feel someone's anger after. And I know that that can really inhibit somebody from setting them. Yes. And that is really a difficult or challenging piece. But I think the big thing to do is not to assume that they'll be offended by your boundary. Because I can think of two million boundaries that people have set with me and I've just done it, whether it's been like, hey, when you come over, take your shoes off or please make sure that you arrive on time is really important. Like all of these boundaries. And I haven't ended my relationship with the person. I haven't gotten so upset at them for having that boundary that I've walked away from them. So I think oftentimes when we think of setting some boundaries, we just think of the worst case scenario. They're going to be upset. They won't talk to me. And that could be the case if there has been some big B boundary violations. But 
if it has been just some minor things, typically people are okay with your boundaries. The biggest thing for you is just spitting it out, just really getting it out there, what you want and need in that situation. But as for the guilt, discomfort may be a part of your process. It's discomfort. So it's not going to feel really good. But what feels really good is not suffering in the future. Because when you continue to put yourself in those situations that you don't want to be in with people, you are suffering. And when you get out of them, although you're like, oh, I hate that I had to tell this person this, it feels really good to no longer be in that situation. Yeah. And having that space taken up. And having that space taken up in a way that does not work for you. And sometimes it doesn't even work for the other person. And I really like that you just outlined a few examples of, you know, from taking your shoes off to showing up on time. What are some other examples of boundary violation that are micro and macro for people who are like, I still want to know deeper? So micro, I would say giving people feedback when they have an ax for it making comments about someone's body, telling them what to do, using their things without permission. I would say that those are all small, but only small in that they are done occasionally. If something happens all the time, then I would say that that's maybe macro because it starts to erode the fabric of the relationship. And so that's when you get into some more difficult relationship issues because the boundary offenses have become so big that they're no longer manageable. And so you don't want a situation where everything is like, oh my, they always tell me this or they're always doing blank. Because if that's the case, it is now a macro issue. But some other macro issues tend to be codependency, enmeshment, trauma bonding, and um, counter dependencies. Those are some things where the relationship now has this continuous issue of boundary violation. And let's break a few of those down for people because we actually talk about those all quite a bit in our brand from codependency to enmeshment. Counterdependency, we haven't touched on enough, but yeah, let's just break those down a little bit from your lens of what that looks like. So counterdependency is a rigid boundary where we keep people out. We don't express any vulnerability. We make it seem as if we have it all together and we do not need anyone's help. That is typically counterdependency. So an avoidant. Avoidant, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so it is a rigid way of trying to stay safe, having hard rules. I never help people financially, not even once, you know, just having these hard rules of, of no, those are all rigid boundaries. Trauma bonding and, and trauma bonding is very interesting because it's almost as if you protect your abuser. And so in situations where you're being mistreated, if you have this background of trauma, sometimes you make excuses for the person mistreating you. You'll say, well, you know, I knew I shouldn't have called him at that time because I knew he would, you know, yell at me or they probably were thinking this or it was my fault because. So we start to develop this idea that people are okay in what they're doing to us because they have all these other things going on or life is so traumatic for them. So that's why they're acting out in this way. You know, like if you have a boss who regularly yells at people and you're like, well, he has a stressful job. It's like, you know, I think a lot of people have stressful jobs and they don't yell at people. (laughs) So how do we hold this person accountable for their behavior without making excuses for it? Because that's not a healthy part of, you know, being in relationships with someone because you suffer. You're the person being yelled at. And then, you know, codependency is where we are enabling people in toxic behaviors and getting in the way of them living their lives Enmeshment, which is often, you know, kind of used very much in line with codependency. Enmeshment is not having any separation between you and another person. So when they feel, you feel. When they need something, you need something. It's almost like you are one in the same. And do you find that, you know, each of those that we just covered are probably the hardest to set boundaries in? those circumstances. 
I don't know. What for you would you say is the hardest area to set boundaries? You know, I definitely grew up in a meshment for sure. Like even to the point where I would sleep in my mom's bed until 11, not in a weird way. It was just she was a single mom and young and unhealed, you know, growing up in an alcoholic household and all of that good stuff. So a lot of enmeshment there. And certainly I learned people pleasing and codependency because of kind of being swapped around a few different households with a young mom. And so for me, it took me a long time to understand my own personal space and that I'm entitled to it, you know, and just like the title of that book you read where... It's it's fine, where you end and I begin. Exactly, which we'll link in the show notes because I'm sure a lot of people will be really interested in that. I would say for me, because I certainly have trauma bonded in a lot of certainly romantic <laughs> relationships, and we teach on that a lot with like, calling in partners, but I would say the hardest, though, still gets back to, and I think it's a a symptom of codependency gets back to the people pleasing is the hardest place to set boundaries for me personally. Yeah. I think we think that caring about people means that they always have to be happy. And I think we can care about people without always trying to please them because that is a never ending job because just as our, our needs change, theirs do too. And so sometimes we're trying to do stuff and we don't even know if that's something that, you know, this person wants. And so we're on this constant cycle of, okay, am I being good? Am I being good? Is this enough? Am I doing? And it is exhausting to constantly consider other people and their needs. What we could do in a healthy way is to ask them what they need. And try to meet those needs. But certainly there are going to be times in a relationship where the needs may really bump up against each other. And you will have to determine how big is my need? Is it important? Do I push my boundary here? I love that. Just asking them what they need. (laughs) How much easier is that than all of the unspoken? And not assuming. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And something you talk about that I really love is protecting your energy instead of just simply saying no. Obviously, it's a form of setting boundaries. Talk about that a little bit, protecting your energy. Well, I think we all have those situations where we notice our energy being drained. And it could be from, you know, maybe watching the news too much or talking to a particular friend or going to certain places. Like, we just notice this. And instead of saying, you know, what's going on here? Is this something that I'm just anxious about because I'm uncomfortable socially? Is this something that I'm anxious about because it's something going on in this dynamic? Is this something that I can prevent? And in many cases with our energy, we can prevent certain things from getting in the way of us being well. For example, I am a therapist and on days that I see clients, I am very particular about who I talk to before and after work because I'm walking into a day of listening to people talk about their problems all day, which is not a stressful thing for me, but I don't want to get off of work and also listen to people (laughs) talk about their problems. Sure, You know, I'm like, I want to get off of work and just like watch TV. It's just like, I don't want to, you know, have more therapeutic conversation. I've done that for eight hours, perhaps on a day when I'm not seeing client, I'm certainly more open to that. And so we know the people in our lives who cause us to like shift that energy. We know the people in our lives who, you know, you get off the phone with them and you need a nap afterwards. Like we know those people, but you know, we try to just like push ourselves through it. Like, oh, I should really talk to this person like based on their title in our lives. So this is my best friend. This is my, you know, so I just have to talk to this person even if I don't feel really good about it. And sometimes protecting your energy is changing the way you engage, particularly with people who are chronic complainers, Sometimes starting the conversation in a different way, asking different types of questions, or even talking more about yourself can really shift the energy in the conversation. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so literally I'm three weeks away from having my first child, and I love the conversation of, 
you know, parenting and especially around boundaries, which I think can be very hard for parents. How can parents begin to navigate boundaries with their children, you know, say preferences or honoring their own boundaries, that communication style, just sort of where do you start with that? Well, I think, you know, parents can really help to shape how kids speak of what they want. And so when I say shape, kids tend to be naturally assertive. They are very good at saying, no, I don't like it. I don't want to. They're very good at saying that stuff. What happens is all the adults tell them, you have to hug them. You have to eat this thing. You don't tell me no. All of these things where the kid now learns like, wow, if I say no, I get in trouble. If I don't wear what she tells me to wear, I get put in my room. If I don't blank, then blank. So there is a consequence for being assertive. And so then we're shocked like, why are all these adults, why are they so passive? Why are they so passive aggressive? Because we've been punished for being assertive. And so in parenting, we have to do our best to help shape the way kids are able to assert themselves. So if a kid wants to wear a certain, like my kids, I I have a seven and a four year old and they pretty much dress themselves. I just buy the clothes and I hope that they pick something that goes well together, but they have their own preferences and they wear, you know, sometimes they'll take their headband, put it across their shirt and they like, this a belt. And I'm like, okay, girl, I don't care. <laughs> um, so, you know, be your little independent self because who's to say that what I have on is the best? You know, you're dressing to your energy. You're dressing to how you feel. And that's not to say just let your kids wear whatever because I do have to, especially with the weather, I'm like, okay, we can't wear a tank top today, right? <laughs> But I think a really good strategy is just even placing some clothes, whether it's like 10 pieces of clothes and letting them sort of pick, let them develop who they are. When they say they don't want to eat something, is there something else that they could eat? And I know for kids, you know, they go through this like macaroni, French fry phase. And, you know, maybe it's, you know, I'm going to put five things on the plate. My expectation is that you eat two And we'll kind of go from there. So really allowing them to develop their eating skills. When kids say they're full, let them be full. Because what we're teaching them when we say you're not full, keep eating, is to bypass that natural sense of fullness. You need to be able to stop when you're done and not eat an entire hamburger because it's in front of you. Can we put it away and come back to it? Can it sit here until, you know, like, what can we do so we're allowing them to have more autonomy in in who they're becoming. Now they can't raise themselves and that's why we have to make sure that their language usage around assertiveness. So, you know, you can't just tell people, yell at people and, you know, be disrespectful in becoming who you are, but there are certainly ways that you can say things that I can understand and other adults can understand for you to be, you know, more of yourself. So really what I'm hearing is coming down to choices, like giving healthy choices and allowing them to preserve their authenticity and develop their personality through it. Yes, absolutely. While maintaining a healthy parameter, such as uh, it's snowing, so we're not wearing tank tops today, (laughs) but here's some long sleeve shirts. Pick which one you want. Yes, yes. Here's five long sleeve shirts. Pick one. You know, it gives them a sense of I can make my own choices, which is healthy for all of us. We all need to be able to make our choices because without that, what happens is we create people who can't make choices on their own. They have, you know, oh, I'm a terrible decision maker. I have to talk to everybody before I make a decision. And a part of that is we have to be able to trust our voice. What do you think is the app, like beyond boundaries, beyond anything, when it comes to parenting and inner child, preserving a child's authenticity, what is the number one tool or asset or important element in your opinion when it comes to psychology? I think the biggest thing is kids need to be seen. Mm -hmm. And loved for who they are, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's the biggest thing lacking. Yeah, I watched a ton of Fred Rogers stuff last year, and I think he did some really beautiful work around listening to kids, talking to kids, (laughs) because 
they don't get the opportunity to do that very much because sometimes as adults, we think the issues they're going through are so like small in comparison. But I remember when my daughter was a baby, she hated the car and she would be in the car and rear facing car seat and she would just cry. And I'm like, you know, it must be really bad to sit back there all alone and not be able to see anyone. Mm hmm. That's how I thought of it. And so, you know, either my or my husband will sit in the back with her because I don't know what she's thinking. You know, this isn't look who's talking. I don't know what the baby is thinking. But if I had to guess and really get into the spirit of where she is, it might be something like that. Like there's no one around me and I really I really need to be comforted right now. That's amazing. I love that. And did you catch his documentary? Yes, I've watched all the things. The movie, the oh. doc, the podcast. <laughs> I mean, I mean, oh, wow. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah, for anybody who's like, who's Fred Rogers? Which I think most of us all know, but also Mr. Rogers growing up. So I know that documentary just blew me away. I mean, what a person. And then rounding this out, I think this is great for people. We kind of touched on this, but just a couple of things that can anchor this a little bit more. What are the ways that we avoid setting healthy boundaries? Ghosting. You remember that? You, you said that we ghost people instead of talking to them. We continue in relationships with them that we're really unhappy with. That's one way we avoid boundaries or we even minimize the need for boundaries. Like, oh, it's not that important. It's not a big deal. And some of that comes from other people when we set a boundary, you know, say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I could do that. It's like, well, it actually is a big deal because you haven't been doing it. So the minimizing of the need for boundaries is also a really big one. I think instead of boundaries, sometimes we gossip about people without even saying to them, this is my issue with you. We tell a bunch of people who are not in the situation to help us about our interactions and problems with this person without directly asking the person to do blank. So I think there are, you know, so many ways that we sort of ignore and minimize the need for boundaries in our attempt to you know, keep ourselves comfortable by not having to set them. I agree. And I am guilty of all of those and many more, especially when boundary settings seem like the scariest thing on the planet to me. So I'm sure quite a few people are resonating with that as well. Not to jump back and forth, but I do think that this is really important too. getting back to children and modeling. What are some of the healthy ways that parents can model healthy boundaries for their kids? Because it's one thing if we're trying to consciously teach them to have a voice and have choices and really hear them and see them. But if we're still people pleasing and trauma bonding and setting, you're not able to set boundaries, eventually they potentially could do the same. Yeah, I, I think those are all really beautiful things that people have to do to model. So just not being better for yourself, but being better for the people who are watching because your kids are seeing you possibly be disrespected by grandma because when grandma comes over, she takes over the house and you you become the kid. So thinking about what you would want your kids to do in that situation could be a very powerful way to um, muster up the courage to even set the boundaries in many situations. But modeling boundaries as a parent, I think a really big boundary is having a beautiful self-care routine to show your kids that I exist outside of you. So often for kids, they don't see you as anything other than mom. I know my kids are like that. So if we go somewhere and someone knows me, they're like, how do they know you? You know, it's like, I work with them. Oh, <laughs> work. You don't just sit at home. You know, it's like, it's like no kids. So, you know, I make it a point to say, hey, I'm talking to my friend. Hey, I'm going to take a bath. Please don't come here. Just really showing them that it's okay to take care of yourself. And I know I asked a version of this earlier, but when you began setting healthy boundaries, how did you see your own world or how do you continually see your client's world shift for the better? Like what are the better things that happen and come into their lives? Well, you know, I think peace. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's really how I came up with the, the name of the book, Set Boundaries, Find Peace, because I think it is just so much, so much more peaceful to not have all of the chaos in your relationships, to not have 
the frustration, the anxiety. It just feels better to have the boundaries, even though they're really hard to set, so that you can have space in the relationship to be you. And then that's the perfect segue to telling us a bit more about the book, you know, Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Yes. Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself. We talked about the find peace part, but the guide to reclaiming yourself, we spoke earlier about this, that it is in us to have the boundaries and we're just really digging in there to pull them out. And oftentimes we already know the boundaries we need and the issue that we're having is how to execute the boundary and do it without guilt. Now, the guilt part is something that we'll just have to manage in the process, but you certainly can learn better strategies to execute the boundary. But the feeling of it, we can feel guilty and do things. We can feel sad and do things. We don't have to get rid of the feeling to do the thing that we need to do. It is about becoming courageous and really pushing through that discomfort to do it. And so in the book, I talk about tons of strategies to really speak your boundaries to other people and to hold boundaries with yourself. Because sometimes after we have told people what our boundaries are, the issue becomes us holding that boundary with people. Because if we want them to do something or not do something, we have to respect our own boundary. And so I talk a ton about that in the book. The book is filled with all sorts of scripts about what to say, what boundary violations look like in you know, in families, in romantic relationships, with kids, with in-laws, with friends, work, all sorts of scenarios where I think we need a deeper understanding of, of what boundary violations are and then how to troubleshoot them. So the book just gives a lot of information around here is the issue and here is the solution to the issue. And I think that that piece is so hard, right? Like they hear all of this information on the podcast of, you know, the do's and the don'ts. But until you actually see the scripts, until you actually see the scenarios with those different dynamics in your life, I think that's when all of the pieces come together. And then it's just finding the courage, like you said, to pull it out of yourself and say it or set it. So I think that that even in my mind alone, is why I would pick up the book. (laughs) The scripts especially would be so, so helpful. Yeah, finding the courage to do what you're already thinking about doing. And I think just seeing all of the different scenarios really helps you to muster up the courage to do it. It, It's helpful to know that it's it's not just you that, that struggles with this, that it is a a collective thing that many people struggle with the guilt and struggle with, you know, the people pleasing piece of setting boundaries. And when does the book come out? Where can we find it? The whole shebang. I'm sure many people listening to this are already following you because, you know, I think you have over 800,000 followers at this point and loving your content. You share so much on there just from comparison to here's what it should look like to say to do something. I mean, fantastic, fantastic Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's one place to find me. Instagram. I'm there. (laughs) That is where I'm most present. Um, I have a website that has some resources, worksheets, tools, and that is www.nedratawab.com. And then the book, Set Boundaries, Find Peace. And it is available everywhere that books are sold. Great. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and being so open. And yeah, I have a lot to digest after this. You know, I'm excited, especially as a parent, how I can dig into this deeper. So I'm really grateful. I think it's a beautiful thing when parents think about how they're going to parent. I've worked with people who are like afraid to be like their parents. And I always tell them, I think you'll be okay because you're actually thinking about parenting. You're aware of it. it. I don't think a lot of people are. So just that lets me know that you're in the space to do some, some really good things. Thank you so much. And good luck with the book launch. With the pandemic and everything, how are you able to celebrate? Oh my gosh, it's so much virtual stuff happening. But, you know, I have a, a small bubble here that I was, you know, able to to celebrate with a little bit. But, 
yeah, it's the pandemic has really shifted things. There are no in-person events or, or getting out or anything like that. So really, you know, a lot of virtual stuff, which is fine. I've yeah, I've completely embraced the pandemic. So I'm sitting at home mostly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, everything will be virtual. And are your kids at home as well right now? Yes. Wow. Wow. Man, that's a whole nother set of boundaries. Yes. Yes. Zoom school and everything. I can't even imagine. And computer time and screen time. And it just, it must be a whole new world. Yes. The new level of parenting boundaries that people have had to have in the pandemic is unparalleled. (laughs) It's like the never ending work of boundaries in the pandemic has proved how many more we need. Yes, I could not agree more. Well, I'm wishing you the most beautiful book launch and afternoon and excited to share this soon. Thank you so much for allowing me into your community. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this You'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward, and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the Ys, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.